Okay, we are recording. Hi everyone and welcome. My name is Kylie Stam. My pronouns are she and hers and I serve as the Elliott Schools Diversity Program Manager in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that our institution exists on the land of the Piscataway and the Cochetank people. And while I recognize we're calling in from different locations, we still gather today as part of the GW community and the Elliott community. And so we share a land acknowledgement as a formal statement to recognize and respect the indigenous peoples that were the traditional stewards of our land and the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. We wanna thank everyone for joining us today. This event is part of the Elliott School's Office of Diversity and Inclusion's Diverse Perspectives in International Affairs series. We're very grateful to our co-sponsors from Leadership Ethics and Practice or the LEAP Institute and the Council on Diversity and Inclusion as part of the Elliott School for making this event possible. Today's topic is Immigrant America, a Hidden Portrait with our guest speaker, Dr. Tomas Jimenez, who I'll introduce in a moment. Yesterday, September 15th, marked the beginning of National Hispanic Heritage Month and GW's recognition of Latinx heritage celebration through October 15th. We recognize um, the many issues that touch the communities that we're recognizing um, and we also recognize the number of communities that are impacted by similar issues. So we're very excited to have this discussion today with all of you. And we invite you to join us in the recognition throughout the month um, to uplift and recognize our Hispanic and Latinx community members. I'm very excited now to introduce our guest speaker today. Tomas Jimenez is a professor of sociology and comparative studies in race and ethnicity. He's also the director of undergraduate program on urban studies. His research and writing focuses on immigration, assimilation, social mobility, and ethnic and racial identity. His latest book, The Other Side of Immigration, or The Other Side of Assimilation, excuse me, How Immigrants Are Changing American Life, uses interviews from a race and class spectrum of Silicon Valley residents to show how a relational form of assimilation changes both newcomers, immigrants, and their children, and established individuals, people born in the US to US born parents. There's a lot more I could share about Dr. Jimenez, but I'll go ahead and turn it over to him so you can hear more from him yourself. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Jimenez. Thanks, Kylie, for that nice introduction. And thank you, um, both Kylie and Professor Lai, for having me here. If I read this right, we have four people attending, right? So we can could we treat this like a we can treat this like a seminar, um, which is fine by me. Um, so uh, I, I just want to um, say good morning to you all from uh, from California, from a California that at least where I live right now is much less smoky today by some kind of miracle. It has rained here in mid-September, and so the air quality index dropped from uh, from extremely unhealthy to um, very, very healthy. I can't tell you how good it is to just walk outside and inhale. Uh, so I'm feeling good this morning. Um, what I want to do today is um, talk about immigration, but I, I want to talk about it uh, in a way that allows us to step back, uh, to step back and take stock of the larger picture uh, and to step back and I think talk about some of the things that aren't getting talked about right now, but I think that should be getting talked about. And in doing so, I'm going to um, avoid rebutting everything that the president says and the people in his administration. There's a real temptation to do that, and quite frankly, I think a real need to do that. Um, but I'm not going to do that. I want to kind of, um, I want to talk about some of what I think are, are really the important issues that are sort of evergreen when it comes to immigration. These are issues related to just general immigration trends, the relationship between immigration and crime, that is the one place where I will rebut the president, um, the issue of unauthorized and documented illegal immigration, the issue of integration, and also what we think about immigration as a country. Uh, and I wanna, as I do so, hopefully what you'll take away is that um, some of what we see in the kind of daily madness and the uh, uh, is an unfortunate metaphor in California right now, but the sort of fires that get set all the time. Uh, some of what we miss is that um, I think we we are actually still a nation of immigrants, as complicated as that idea is. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to share my screen with you, and um, and uh, we'll go from there. Kylie, are we good? Can we see it? Just <laughs> all right. 
Okay. Um, so as Kylie mentioned, I'm a, I'm a sociologist. I also um, am a core faculty member in, the, in our Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity at Stanford. And I should mention, just to brag on my institution a little bit, that um, CSRE was, uh, as we call it, is, um, is essentially our equivalent of ethnic studies and, and one of the first of its kind, especially among our peer institutions. Uh, so as Harvard and Princeton and Yale try to uh, do something similar to what we've had for 25 years, we uh, we have to brag about ourselves a little bit. Okay, so I want to kind of get a sense of the big picture first. And, and I think the first thing to know is that we have a lot of immigrants in the United States today. Uh, the second thing I want you to know about that is that's about normal. Um, so let's take a look at a, a graph by uh, that put together every year by the Migration Policy Institute, located right there in Washington, D.C., and, and I think it's the preeminent think tank when it comes to immigration. And this graph shows a couple of things. The orange line shows the number of immigrants as a percent of the US population. And the blue line shows the number of immigrants uh, as, a, as a kind of total. Uh, and let's take a look at the blue line first. And I think it should be clear that as we move, uh, and I don't know, I'm gonna move with my mouse as a kind of pointer. Uh, as we move from the mid 19th century all the way to 2018, we have more immigrants in the United States than we ever have. Nearly 45 million people were born in another country. And I should mention this graph shows everyone who was born in another country, regardless of their legal status. But if you look at the orange line, uh, we actually had, as a share of the total U.S. population, for a good part of the 19th century, the same level of uh, immigration that we have today, or same number, percentage of immigrants uh, that we have today. The weird part of American history in many ways is the middle part of the 20th century when there was a long hiatus of immigration. And that hiatus was partly due to a set of restrictive immigration laws passed in the mid 1920s that um, barred for all intents and purposes, uh, Southern and Eastern European immigration. It also officially made illegal immigration from Asia. Uh, it said that anyone who was not considered legally white could not immigrate sorry, anyone who did not qualify for citizenship could not immigrate, and people who did not quite qualify for citizenship were regarded as legally non-white, and that included Asians and also people from Africa. Um, and then there was a Great Depression and a world war, and there were several factors that conspired to end immigration. And then in 1965, um, Congress passed and Lyndon Johnson signed sweeping immigration reform that opened up immigration from um, Asia in particular, um, but also did something weird with immigration from Latin America. So Latin America was exempt from those restrictive immigration laws. And in 1965, part of what the law did was distributed visas more equitably across the globe, but also put an overall cap for the first time ever on Latin American countries, including Mexico. And that sparked a wave of unauthorized immigration that is really a prominent feature of our immigration immigrant population today. So one of the things that I want you to know is we have a lot of immigrants. Second thing I want you to know is that's sort of normal. If you look back at American history, the mid part of the 20th century is kind of a weird uh, part. Third thing I want you to know is that uh, immigration comes overwhelmingly today from Latin America and Asia. The major, the, excuse me, the, uh, the largest contributor to uh, Im the immigrant population today comes from Latin America, uh, but the largest number of new immigrants arriving in the United States this is pre-COVID, of course, comes from Asia. Actually, there are more immigrants arriving from Asia today than there are Latin America. Um, and then the third thing I want you to know is, and I'll get to this more a little bit later, is that there are a lot of um, unauthorized immigrants in the United States today. Some people say unauthorized, some people say undocumented, some people say illegal. I'll back switch back and forth between undocumented and unauthorized. Um, <clears throat> And that is a prominent feature and, and what I think is probably the most problematic feature of immigration today for reasons that I'll, I'll share in a minute. Um, and the other thing that I want you to know about Im that immigration, it is truly natural. Actually, let me back up and say one other thing. Uh, so this, this counts the, the share of the population that is foreign born, but when you combine the share of the population that's foreign born with the share of the population that is the children of immigrants, the US born children of immigrants. So that would like include people like me, my dad's from Mexico. Um, that's about 25% of the US population. And in big metro areas, like the one that I live in, Washington DC is sort of a newer immigrant gateway. You have a huge share of the population that are immigrants or the children of immigrants. And so 
That immigrant experience is a defining experience in many metro areas. In the area that I live in, for example, more than half of the population are either immigrants or the children of immigrants. And that would be true in places like uh, LA, certainly Miami, Dade, New York City. And so it is, it is sort of a defining feature in, in many areas of the United States. Immigration is also a defining feature in more and more places in the United States. So <clears throat> I guess this is the fourth major feature of immigration today that, that I think we have to keep in mind, that if we go back to just 1990, uh, and I'm old enough to be able to say just 1990, but for some of you that might, that might be predate you, <laughs> your birth. Um, <clears throat> Uh, if we go back to 1990, and this is a map of the United States in 1990, and uh, I've divided up the United States into its counties, and the darker the county, the higher uh, the proportion of the population in that county is foreign born. And I want you to pay attention as I kind of forward through all the way to the contemporary period to what happens in these Midwestern um and kind of Great Plains uh, counties and also in the South. And you can even keep an eye on yourselves here in Washington, D.C. to see how much things change, especially between 90 and 2000. And then as we go to 2010, and I think I have one more 2016. And what you see is that there are now large, large immigrant populations in places like Washington State, places like Idaho, southwestern Kansas is an area where I've done lots of research, this little county right here called Finney County that looks like a, a kind of backward seven, uh, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Georgia, if you look at the northern parts of Georgia, North Carolina, look at the DC and its suburbs, the bit Iowa. So immigration is really a national phenomenon, which I think helps explain in particular why um, the issue of immigration resonates so broadly as a, as a political issue, but also as a social issue. And we can talk a little bit about what's going on in, in some of these so-called new gateways. So outside of the traditional kind of Florida, California, Texas, and, and Northeast corridor. Okay, let me get in. This is, this is the most I'll rebut the president. So uh, we often hear that there is a crisis of illegal immigration. Uh, and, and in some ways, I agree, but I don't think it's the one that you've heard about. And although the president has not talked about it this election cycle as much as he has in the past, um, as you well know, uh, the idea that there is a flood of illegal, in air quotes, immigrants coming across the United States uh, that are sort of not just uh, large in numbers, but they're marauding, that they are out to kill people, to... Uh, to commit sexual assault. They, um, they are, as the president said, rapists, drug dealers, murderers. Um, this is what you've been hearing about. And in fact, in the 2018 election cycle, the midterm elections, uh, President Trump uh, really played up the caravan that was supposedly going to flood across our borders. And he also um, made a prominent feature of, his, of the 2018 campaign. Um, I think he calls them blue star moms. And these are people whose children or loved ones have been victims of violent crime at the hands of unauthorized immigrants. They even set up when, when the president first came into office, uh, an a office in US CIS that was supposed to address the victims of crime at the hands of unauthorized immigrants. Um, I haven't kept up, but I know when the office had been open for about a year, it, the, there still really wasn't clear what they had done. This was largely symbolic. It, this is all to say that the narrative they hear is that there's a lot of crime being committed by uh, immigrants and, and unauthorized immigrants in particular, that uh, somehow illegality is like a gateway crime or something. But let's step back and just look at what's happened with crime in the United States over the past three decades. Uh, well, really two and a half decades for what I have data here. So I have data from the FBI and the Bureau of Justice and uh, I have data on violent, and this is put together by the Pew Research Center. I'm gonna show you a lot of Pew data because I think they do really good work. Um, I'm gonna show you that we have uh, data on violent crime and we also have data on property crime. And um, if it's not clear from looking at the pictures here, I'll just tell you that the upshot here is that violent crime and property crimes have plummeted in, uh, in the last um, two and a half decades. They're still going down. We've actually seen a blip up in some violent crime, but the overall trend uh, is is a downward trend. And this is actually one of the kind of amazing descriptive findings from social science and one that a lot of demographers and criminologists um, are, are trying to explain. And, and we can talk about that 
uh, the, the variety of reasons why that might be in a second, but we've had this massive decrease in crime. We actually had this massive decrease in crime uh, during, well, let me actually, so, let me, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, uh, but we've had this massive decrease in crime over here on the right, and this is uh, victims of, this is violent crime reported, at the same time that perceptions over this period of crime have gone up. So we think there's a lot of crime happening in the United States, even as it goes down. Um, I mean, think of, maybe I'll speak for myself and not your grandparents, but think of your grandparents watching the kind of six or seven, six o'clock news and and uh, and you know that and um, that kind of reports on things that that bleed, as they say in the news. If it bleeds, it leads. Um, but we've had this tremendous drop in the crime rate at the very time where we've had a spike in the immigrant population. Now I'm committing a, a sort of analytical fallacy here, or, or analytical um, faux pas, because I'm implying that um correlation might be causation and it's not just a, a conclusion that i draw from the graph that i'm showing you but it's a conclusion i draw from really excellent work by criminologists like patrick sharkey at any rate there is actually a relationship between the share of the immigrant population in the united states and the violent crime rate as we have more immigrants in the united states the violent crime rate goes down and we can look at this uh, by um, state. So each of these dots represents a state in a year running from 1990 to 2014. This is something that uh, that the Washington Post published uh, a couple years ago. And this looks at the share of the undocumented population in that state. And there's a pretty clear line here that as the undocumented population increases in a state in a year, the violent crime rate in that state in that year goes down. Um, we can look at this by um, by major metro areas, as the New York Times did, and uh, and the trend, if I were to draw a line, would kind of go like this again. As I mean, look at look at cities like New York and Miami, which have two of the largest immigrant populations in the United States. I actually don't know what city this is, um, but uh, but what you see is clearly the crime rate has plummeted in places where we have lots of immigrants. The other part of the um, the kind of illegal immigration crisis that we hear about has to do with the border. President Trump, as as you well know, made it a a kind of focus of his campaign and to some degree his presidency to build the wall and of course make Mexico pay for it. Um, and in doing so, he portrayed the border as being out of control. That there were, as I mentioned a minute ago, floods of flood a flood of immigrants who are potentially coming. Uh, to to kind of commit crimes. The truth is that the border has not been um, this much in control in about 50 years. So this is a, um, a total Southwest border apprehension. So the, the uh, Customs and Border Patrol keeps track of how many people um, they apprehend trying to come across the border. Uh, and then you get a total per year. This just goes up through kind of the beginning of 2019. So it's slightly dated, but not a ton. Um, and and the, I hope you see a clear trend here, which was the border apprehensions really spiked in the late 90s and the early 2000s and have gone down thereafter precipitously. And you might attribute this in part to um, a greater border fortification. We had a massive buildup in border security starting in the mid 90s and that has continued to today, but we are apprehending about the same number of immigrants in the last five or six years that we were apprehending in the early 1970s when the border was hardly as fortified. In fact, uh, it, it was pretty easy to come across the border then, you'd get caught, but, but the success rate was incredibly high. Um, so actually the border is quite quiet in historical terms. And um, this was just put out by the Pew Research Center looking at what, ha what has happened after COVID. The, the border, you should know as a, as a matter of policy, is closed. Um, but if you look at the kind of pre-COVID period uh, going for in late 2019 to early 2020, we were still well below the rate of apprehensions, if you say, compare it to even 2019 or to the year 2000. Um, 2017 was a particularly low point, but historically, the border is really, really quiet. Um, I mentioned a second ago that we have a lot more border security, um, including border patrol agents. This graph shows the number of border patrol agents uh, and maps it on to the apprehension rate. So one might say that 
we have a much better ability to apprehend people who are attempting to cross the border today, and yet we are catching fewer than we did uh, even in 1975 when the ability was not nearly as uh, as strong. And it, you know, as an aside, this says something about how much you know. If if the idea is to apprehend uh, um, potential unauthorized crossers. Uh, then we are paying a lot of money because we're employing a lot of Border Patrol agents to apprehend fewer than we did uh, even when I was born in 1975, <clears throat> which don't do the math. I'll just tell you right now, I'm 25. Um, so uh, the, other, the other thing that's going on uh, along the southern border is an, an incredible decline in Mexican immigration. This is a little bit dated, but it continues to be true today that we have had actually net negative Mexican migration for about a decade. That is to say, there are more Mexican immigrants leaving the United States than coming to the United States. Uh, now, you need to understand that Mexican immigration is the kind of elephant in the room in contemporary immigration. It remains the largest uh, immigrant group in the United States um, and by a ton. Um, but going back about 10 years ago, Mexicans were about a third of the immigrant population. The next largest immigrant population was a kind of um, tie between China and the Philippines at about 4%. So the Mexican immigrant population still dwarfs the overall population, but even as a going back a decade or, and more, as a share of new immigrants, Mexico still dominated. That's no longer true. Mexico, the United States is a net exporter of Mexican immigrants. And that exportation comes partly from, uh, from deportations. There's a, uh, the Obama administration deported more immigrants than anyone in American history, and the Trump administration has never come close to deporting that number of immigrants, not that this is a, a competition that, that we should be um, celebrating in any way. Um, but uh, but the, the bulk of Latin American immigration now comes from the so-called Northern Triangle countries, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. And these are the countries that were contributing to the so-called caravans. Uh, and, it, I, and those caravans were <clears throat> in some ways substantial, but nowhere near, and these countries are far smaller than Mexico's. And so they were nowhere near the scale of mass Mexican migration. It appears that after about an 80 year continual influx of Mexican immigrants, one that was particularly heavy starting in about 1975, mass Mexican migration is over. And as we project forward, that is a, has huge implications. We can talk about this in Q&A, huge implications for the demographic makeup of the United States, for integration, and I think even for US-Mexico relations. So I talked about there being a lot of unauthorized immigrants in the United States, and that's still the case, but not as many as there has been. Um, the peak of uh, the size of the unauthorized immigrant population was in about uh, 2006, where it reached 12.2 million. Today, there are about 10.5 million. These are the latest figures we have. There are about 10.5 million. So it's dropped pretty dramatically, but for the most part, it's held steady since about the start of the Great Recession. And so, um, so this is a key feature and something else you should know about the notion that there's a kind of out of control growth of unauthorized immigration. And I, Mexico used to be, uh, used to contribute the majority of unauthorized immigrants. That's actually no longer the case. It is not only that Mexico is not really contributing any immigrants mathematically, uh, but they no longer constitute the majority of unauthorized immigrants in the United States. Um, now, if you add up all the other countries combined, Mexico has uh, is now a minority of unauthorized immigrants. Again, a really, really big deal given what we know historically about Mexican immigration. But there still is a large unauthorized immigrant population. And here's where I think you get a sense of what I think is the crisis of unauthorized, not unauthorized immigration, but unauthorized immigrants. Uh, and the crisis becomes comes into focus when you look at how many people who have been here for 10 years or more. It's about two thirds of unauthorized immigrants have been here for more than a decade. And I'm sure as you've read in news reports and perhaps even academic accounts, um, unauthorized immigrants, uh, adults have families here, they have jobs, they own businesses, they own houses. There's a level of integration that is, that is quite substantial. And as I'll make a, as I'll emphasize in a second, it is there 
uh, illegality that I think prevents them from being fully integrated in the United States. This is the thing that prevents them from being fully integrated. But what I want you to take away from this is that um, most unauthorized immigrants are not just coming across the border. They're people who actually have who have lives here, who have lives that that they've established in the period of more than a decade in the United States. And here's where the crisis begins to come into relief. I argue, <clears throat> and and um, and have argued many places, uh, that there is no greater impediment to the integration of today's immigrant population than the unauthorized status uh, that so many of today's immigrants carry. And I'll explain this graph in a second. It's a little bit complicated. Um, and what we know from emerging social science is that the unauthorized status affects not only integration of the immigrant generation, but also subsequent generations. One thing to keep in mind when we talk about integration, incorporation, and assimilation is that it's not just something that immigrants do. It's something that uh, happens over the course of generations, and we often lose sight of that. Uh, you know, and you can ignore this graph for a second as I as I kind of go off on a little bit of a tangent here. But we, you know, if you talk to some people about their own immigrant ancestors, if they came along, you know, generations ago, they had this notion that people arrived at Ellis Island, uh, picked up an American flag, and by the time they got to Battery Park uh, in the southern part of Manhattan, they spoke English perfectly and pledged allegiance to the American flag. That's not what happened. It was a we know now that it was a multi-generation process. And we can talk about what the result was at the end of that process, maybe in Q&A. I think Professor Lai has some questions about that. Um, so let's get back to this graph to talk about the intergenerational penalty that unauthorized immigration exacts. So these are data that were collected in the Los Angeles metro area by a team of researchers at UC Irvine uh, and UCLA, some of, the, some of the best minds who are studying immigration. And what they looked at is what happened when, uh, when the immigrant generation, and they're looking at women in particular, the immigrant generation uh, came unauthorized and legalized, and what happened when the immigrant generation came unauthorized and remained unauthorized. In 1986, there was a mass legalization program signed into law by Ronald Reagan. And that legalization program uh, saw participation mostly from Mexican immigrants. So this looks at Mexicans in the LA area. There are lots of Mexicans in the LA, people of Mexican descent in the LA area. And what it shows is that, and I don't, Kylie, can you see my, my pointer here if I, okay, good. Um, what it shows is that if you are a man, if you are a man or you are a woman and your mother came unauthorized and remain unauthorized, you experience a significant penalty in the number of years of education that you receive compared to people who are men or women and whose mother came unauthorized but legalized. So these lines, these solid lines up here, their kind of immigrant generation was able to legalize and you see what their educational trajectories are thereafter. And, and you know, this is more, these are all people who got more than a high school degree, okay? These are all people who got less than a high school degree almost up until the third generation is only when they start to catch up. So there's an intergenerational penalty if, if um, individuals in the immigrant generation are not allowed to legalize. Um, but when they are, what we know, especially from Mexican origin women in LA, that by the time they reach the 3.5 generation or even the, the, the 3.5 generation would mean that they had one non-immigrant great-grandparent and, uh, excuse me, grandparent and one immigrant grandparent. But when they're uh, allowed to legalize, this 3.7 years of, sorry, this 3.7 years of education is the same number of years of education for the average U.S.-born white woman in L.A. Um, so one could say that at least in terms of educational attainment, when women of Mexican descent uh, have an immigrant ancestor who is able to legalize, they fully, they have the same number of years of education as white women in LA. Um, and that's a big deal. Is that all clear? Okay. The other place we start to see, <clears throat> there's been reporting about this, the other place we start to see the penalty of uh, unauthorized immigration is when it comes to mental health. And not just the mental health of unauthorized immigrants themselves, but the mental health of their children. 
with a team of researchers here at Stanford um, in the Immigration Policy Lab led by uh, the brilliant Jens Heimuller, um, we looked at organ health data. And we got all of Oregon's health data and looked in particular at Mexican immigrants. And for a variety of complicated reasons, we can say that the Oregon health data who contain Mexican immigrant women are largely unauthorized. We know that, that, um, that Oregon has a relatively new Mexican immigrant population, they're largely unauthorized. And something happened in 2012, in the fall of 2012, and that's the President uh, Obama signed into uh, an executive order called the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, also known as DACA. And DACA is not a full legalization, but it provides a reprieve from deportation. That is, as long as you sign up for the program and you meet certain criteria, you will not be deported, so long as you also don't, um, you don't uh, break any laws. And they had an age cutoff. And they said, if you were born after June 15th of 1981, you qualify for DACA. If you're born before June 15, 1981, you don't qualify. So this for a social scientist presents an opportunity to do a natural experiment. The June 15th, 1981 cutoff date is a bit arbitrary. And so if we look at what happens to individuals, you can look at a variety of things that could happen to individuals, but if you look at the before June 15th, 1981 cutoff, people who were born before that, and people who were born after that, you can see in some ways what the direct effect of a legalization might have on a population. Here, we're not looking necessarily at the immigrants themselves, we're actually looking at their children's outcomes. So this is when Mexican immigrant, or I should say, uh, Hispanic immigrant women enroll their children, their U.S. born children, in, um, in um, Oregon's version of Medicaid. And this is reporting here um, diagnoses of uh, adjustment or anxiety disorder. And this is what the pre-DACA period looks like. So if we take a snapshot of their outcomes prior to DACA, this is what the mental health outcomes of the uh, women of the children of mothers who are ineligible for DACA look like versus the children of immigrants who are eligible. There's no difference. They have the same kind of uh, diagnoses of uh, adjustment or anxiety disorder. Here's what happens when we take the same measurement after DACA. It shows that if your mother is eligible for DACA, you're way less likely, and this is statistically significant, so I shouldn't say way, there's, it's statistically significant. Uh, the, the, um, the magnitude is, is um, I think, uh, important, um, but it shows unequivocally that DACA has a direct effect on the mental health outcomes of not just, uh, not just immigrant women, but the children of immigrants. So the, the, the children of immigrants who have a mother who is not eligible for DACA have higher diagnoses of anxiety and adjustment disorder. And this kind of comports with what we know from media reporting, what, we, uh, what we've seen in some of the ethnographic work that's been done. And, and this study is actually really important because it's really hard to show that legal status has a direct effect on something without doing an experiment. And, and for the most part, we can't randomly take a bunch of people and legalize them and then follow them and, and then leave another group of people unauthorized and then follow them. So this is the best we have. Um, the Migration Policy Institute has also done some recent work uh, in Harris County and Texas and also in Rhode Island looking at the mental health of um, Latino immigrants there. Um, and I think you also get a picture of the fact that unauthorized status affects immigrants and their children, not just in kind of their ability to gain an employment uh, their, and their ability to learn English, uh, their, their kind of overall social mobility, but also um, there's a network effect. And so I just, this is just a snapshot of some of the things that they found. But if you look at um, just the share of Latino students in Harris County and Rhode Island who are worried about the detention or deportation of a family member or friend, uh, you know, the full sample, it's it's nearly 6 in 10. Uh, it's almost 7 in 10 in Harris County, half in Rhode Island. Um, and you can also look at um, just the share of people who are not just worried, but actually knew somebody who had been deported, and it's quite high. And that anxiety is something that in many ways hangs over uh, and, and sort of um, hangs inside the psyche of immigrants today, particularly under this administration, but also the previous. 
Um, so the crisis of um, the crisis of uh, undocumented, illegal, unauthorized immigration is really about integration. It's not about the border. It's not about the growth of the unauthorized immigrant population. It's really about what unauthorized status does to the ability of immigrants, their children, their grandchildren to integrate. If we could do one thing, if we could do one thing to speed up integration in the United States, it would be a mass legalization program. The fourth thing I want you to know about immigration that I think we really miss today is that the US actually does not hate immigrants. Overall, we have an ambivalent view of immigration. We have a mixed view of immigration. And I'm gonna give you a sense of that mixed view, but also I think present to you what are what I have found to be surprising findings. And they're surprising in view of what we hear on the news. They're surprising in view of what we hear as the um, that kind of major platform, particularly the Republican Party. And I, this is not a partisan, uh, a, a kind of partisan hit job by any means. Um, this is, you can just look at the party platform and it says it right there. Um, but it, it is that we actually don't hate immigrants, that we actually, um, I think, have better views of immigrants than, than we might get the impression of. Here's the impression that you get. You know, Donald Trump looked to end DACA. Uh, the Supreme Court ruled that it would stay in effect, although they have kind of slowed down the wheels of renewal. Uh, we, we've we've heard about um, the the kind of uh, reins being taken off of immigration customs enforcement. We started off this administrative the travel ban. We know that the administration has separated parents from children uh, who um, who are asylum seekers and put them in cages. This is the kind of notion we get, and this is I don't mean to diminish this. This is real. Uh, and horrific, in my opinion, and horrific. I say this as somebody who cares about um, living in a democracy and living in a place that um, I think should be a, a kind of beacon of freedom and hope. And I and I don't and, and I think you get a sense of whether we are that by how we treat the least among us and how we treat the stranger. And maybe maybe some of my Christian upbringing shows, my Catholic upbringing shows there. Um, but here's what we think. Here's one one picture that um, that begins to tell the story of what we think about immigrants. So the Gallup poll has been asking since 1966 whether Americans want immigration to be kept at its present level, whether they want it increased or decreased. And you can get a sense of how much uh, the United States is sort of against immigrants by following, I think, a couple of lines. And I want you to pay attention uh, well, I think all three lines, but I want you to pay particular attention to this gray line, which shows the share that want it decreased. So if you go back to 1966, we actually, it was a very low point of immigration. There were very few new immigrants in the United States then. Um, but as I said, as we started in 1975, up to the late 90s, we had a huge increase in immigrants. But then in the late 90s, we saw a tremendous drop in the share who wanted the number of immigrants increase. Here's a kind of 9-11 effect. But the overall trend has been a downward trend, such that about 28% of Americans today, up from down from a high of 65%, say they want immigrant immigration to be decreased. And then if you look at the share who want it to be kept the same, and again, in this period, we have a very large number of immigrants coming, so keeping it the same means a large number of immigrants, or increase goes up. Part of this is a compositional effect. So you actually in here are gonna have more Americans who are immigrants or the children of immigrants themselves, but that's not the full story. If you look at um, what people think about what we should do, uh, so let, let me back up. So this is all to say that, um, that more Americans today want the same number of immigrants or even more immigrants uh, than, than the share of Americans who want fewer immigrants. Um, it's also true that, um, that I think most Americans, in fact, the overwhelming majority of Americans share my view, um, and I'm inferring something here, share my view that if we wanna speed up immigrant integration, if we wanna do the right thing, we would have a mass legalization program. So this comes from a CNN poll conducted in June of 2019, but they also have the same, they also asked the same question in 2017, 2018, and it says, in dealing with immigrants already living in the U.S. illegally, should the government's top priority be deporting all people living in the U.S. illegally or developing a plan to allow some people living in the U.S. illegally to become legal residents? 80% of Americans said that they wanted a plan for legal residency, 82% in 
2018, 84% in 2017. This question gets asked in various ways, and no matter how you ask it, even when you talk about a pathway for citizenship, you get a slight decrease. If you talk about a slat, uh, uh, you, if you talk about a pathway to citizenship, so long as immigrants agree to learn English and pass a criminal background check and pay back taxes, the 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 share of people who support such a program skyrockets. I've seen as high as 90 percent in the last 10 years. You can't get 80% of Americans to agree on anything right now, but they agree on this. And I think that's important. If you break um, down some of uh, the kind of major issues in immigration right now by, um, by party identification, um, particularly on the issue of DACA, I think you see a surprising picture. And this, there's, a, there's a CBS poll um, asked just this last May, in general, do you favor or oppose allowing young immigrants who are brought to the U.S. illegal as children to remain in the country if they meet certain requirements, such as going to school or joining the military and not having a criminal record. 85% of Americans support this. This is basically not just DACA, it's the DREAM Act. 73% um, of Republicans support uh, the language of, uh, of the DREAM Act. 95% of Democrats and 84% of independence, overwhelming support for a legalization for young people. Um, <clears throat> now, there are big partisan differences. This is a poll that was done by the Pew Research Center. Um, when they ask people about the kind of effect that immigrants have on our identity, and um, they break down the share of people who say, if America is too open to the people from all over the world, we risk losing our identity as a nation. And then there's another um, kind of option for this question. America's openness to people from all over the world is essential to who we are as a nation. This gets to the kind of, do we think we're a nation of immigrants? 67% agree with the idea that uh, being open to people from all over the world is essential to who we are as Americans. I'm not gonna actually go through all the kind of various breakdowns just in the interest of time, but maybe as I talk, you can look over them. And if you have questions, we can talk about that. And then if you look at the, grow, the people who agree that the growing number of newcomers from other countries threatens traditional American values, 41% agree with that, but 51% agree that the growing number of newcomers from other countries strengthens American society. If we jump down to the kind of Republican, lean Republican, Democrat, lean Democrat, this includes independents. Most independents are either, um, if you look at kind of their, their core beliefs, are either look more like Republicans or more like Democrats. There are huge partisan differences, huge partisan differences. Um, but even in a Republican party right now that has staked a claim to being kind of, uh, you know, uh, tough on immigration, you still get uh, almost half who believe that um, welcoming people from all over the world is essential to who we are as a nation. Uh, not quite as many who believe that our strength comes from uh, our, uh, our growing number of newcomers. Um, so there are big differences by partisanship, but there are also big differences over time in ways that I actually think looks us may, makes us look um, more welcoming to immigrants than you might get the impression from reading the news and the like. Um, so if we just look at over time, this is sort of the same question, but going back in time a bit, the percent uh, who say growing numbers of newcomers strengthens the United States, it's actually up among, the, um, in, among both Democrats and Republicans since the election of Donald Trump. But even among in the Republican Party, it's gone from 22%, so less than one in four, to almost one in three who believe that growing numbers of newcomers strengthens American society. This is, at least this is not what I would have expected if you had told me that we had a um, that we had almost four years of a president who has been staunchly against uh, growing the immigrant population and his administration has done everything they can to stifle the growth of the immigrant population. His own party uh, has actually become increasingly as his party increasingly believes that growing number of immigrants um, strengthens American society. Um, Few, and then one of the other things that, that social scientists have looked at lately is the, is the kind of white threat narrative, which is the idea that growing immigration and the increasing diversity in the United States is a threat to whites. And part of um, the, how they respond to that threat is by becoming um, kind of more anti-immigrant, more authoritarian, and, and more likely to support somebody like the president who runs on a, 
and governs on an anti-immigrant platform. Um, and um, but this looks at um, the share of people who say that um, a majority a minority country uh, is a bad or good thing for the country. And if you look at the share of uh, Republicans who think that it's uh, bad for the country, uh, it has actually gone down. At the beginning of the Trump presidency, almost 40 percent of Republicans thought that a growing majority minority country was bad. Now it's 21 percent. They've mostly switched to this kind of it's neither bad nor good for the country, only a slight increase in the per share who think that it's neither bad or good. Something similar has actually happened among Democrats or people who lean Democrats. It kind of spiked and then went down. Um, but the overall trend line from 2016 is up in terms of the share who think it's good for the country to have a majority minority population. And then the, the share of people who um, think it's neutral or negative has gone down. You get a better, you get a sense of um, what people think about immigration, not just by looking at the country as a whole, but potentially by looking at um, specific places. And in the interest of time, I'm going to kind of, because I've been talking for way too long already, uh, I'm going to kind of march through this pretty quickly. So uh, I'm, I'm working on a book right now with a couple of social psychologists and a political scientist where we studied Arizona and New Mexico. Arizona has been unequivocally the most anti-immigrant, and I'm looking at its policies state in the union, New Mexico has been one of the most welcoming, judging by its policies. And by its policies, I mean access to institutions, rights, and resources sponsored by the state that are accessible to immigrants and unauthorized immigrants in particular. So we did an experiment there. We did a big survey. And then in that survey, we did an experiment. We primed half the people to think that their lawmakers were going to make uh, things more welcoming for immigrants. We primed the other half to believe that things were going to be less welcoming for immigrants. And then we asked them about how it made them feel. We wanted to know whether it increased their social psychological affect, that is kind of positive feelings. And we also want to know whether it made them feel like they belonged more or less in their state. And we asked this question of Latinos, and we also asked it of U.S. born whites. So let me show you what we found. When we look at the difference between the kind of hostile prime and welcoming prime, and we break it down by political ideology, and this is foreign born Latinos, when you are told that your state is going to think, make things more welcoming for immigrants, that you have, you're much more likely to report positive affect if you're a liberal, moderate, or conservative foreign born Latino. Same is true of US born uh, Latinos, although that's slightly diminished among the conservative uh, U.S. born Latinos. When we look at whites, we see a similar trend among liberals and moderates, not so much among conservatives. This is to say that even among U.S. born whites, the majority of U.S. born whites, when you ask them if, when you're sorry, when you tell them that things are going to be more welcoming in the places that they live for immigrants, U.S. born whites, particularly liberal whites, feel as good as foreign born Latinos about that prospect. Moderates also feel much better than if things are hostile. It's only conservatives who feel less, uh, less positive about it. We asked them a series of questions about belonging. Uh, we see similar trends among foreign born Latinos, regardless of political ideology, similar trends among uh, U.S. born Latinos, and similar trends among U.S. born whites. This is actually statistically significant, though the magnitude of the difference is pretty small and similar among conservatives. So actually, overall, um, Americans, including white, I should say, whites and Latinos in these two states don't mind if things are going to become more welcoming. Let me finish by summarizing what's happening with integration, because we've really lost this as part of the national conversation on immigration, even though I think it is the underlying driving force of the national conversation, which is integration. And the punchline is it's happening. And that's the conclusion of a huge study done by uh, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, where they, uh, they took stock of all of the available research on various dimensions of integration, social, political, and economic. And the overwhelming conclusion is that over the course of generations, immigrants are integrating into American society much as they did in the past, if not faster. The big caveat is that, uh, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, people who are unauthorized experience uh, at, a, at a deficit because of their legal status and their ability to integrate. Um, Kylie mentioned my, my last book, uh, which came out a couple of years ago, and you should, you should all go and buy several copies because I have a mortgage and two kids. Um, 
I, I really actually don't. Thank you, Kylie, for smiling. I don't actually make that much money on, on books at all. Uh, at any rate, that's not the point. The point here uh, is that I conceive of and actually find studying the Silicon Valley, but I think there's actually true more generally, that immigration is something of a, uh, sorry, assimilation is something of a two-way street. That as immigrants and their children come to the United States and adjust to a new society, they adjust, their adjustments uh, require that long residing US born members uh, of, uh, of the United States uh, have to make adjustments of their own. And there's a kind of back and forth volley of adjustment and readjustment that over the course of generations results in really new ways of thinking about what it means to belong in the United States. The challenge I mentioned a second ago is illegality, and I want to leave on a, on a kind of final point that we are, um, the conversations about everything in the United States are, uh, to borrow the title Bob Woodward's new book, um, filled with rage. And, and I think some of the rage comes from a notion that, uh, that we are either pure or impure, uh, that we, as, as, uh, if, that we live in some kind of Marvel universe where there are good guys and bad guys, and the bad guys must be destroyed and the good guys uh, must be saved. Uh, and only the good guys can save us from the bad guys. It is the view, I think, that people on the right have of people on the left, and it is a view that people on the left have of people on the right. And in talking to literally hundreds of people over one and one plus hours of conversation about immigration, I have found that people actually have very nuanced views about immigration. If I were somebody who had very conservative views about immigration, and I took the sum total of these conversations, I could not come to the conclusion that any of them were pure. If I had, were somebody on uh, the left who, uh, who had very liberal views about immigration and listened to the sum total of these interviews, I could not possibly come to the conclusion that people were pure. People are ambivalent in how they think about immigration. People have complicated views, often conflicting views. And when you hear them work out these views in real time, uh, I think you become uh, less prone, at least I have become less prone to, to viewing the world uh, as it is in the Marvel universe. I listen to my children, I have two boys, seven and nine, and they literally talk about get the good guys, and this is a good guy, and this is a bad guy. And, it, and I sort of lament the fact that that is, that is sort of the tenor of our national discourse right now. So I've talked for way too long, especially for a Zoom call. I'm sorry, I get excited and go on tangents, but I'm happy to take questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm happy to share it if you want me to dive back in any of these graphs. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm gonna take a moment just to introduce Dr. Lal, who will help with some of the, the questions in, in this portion of the event. Um, Dr. Roly Lal is an associate professor at the Elliott School, where she teaches graduate courses international security and foreign policy and finance capstones which focuses on organized crime terrorism identity and extremism previously she was an associate professor at the u.s department of defense an assistant professor at the Laird management school and a political scientist at Rand. dr law received her phd in international relations and her ma in strategic studies from the johns hopkins university school of international studies so Dr. Lal, thank you so much for being here. Um, she also serves as the faculty co-chair for our Council on Diversity and Inclusion, um, where we have the opportunity to work together. So thank you for being here, and I'll turn it over to you for some questions. Um, thanks, Kylie. And I wanted to say uh, thank you to Dr. Jimenez uh, for a really uh, wonderful talk that goes through so much information about what we really need to understand on the topic today. And um, in particular, I thought that it was um, really relevant how, um, how he highlighted that things aren't as bad as one might think, that so many communities are perfectly welcoming of immigrants. And even those, you know, even if you're thinking that Republicans or people on the right um, feel differently, um, the data doesn't seem to be reflecting that. So I thought that was uh, really positive to see that this country is still very welcoming. Um, and with that, I wanted to um, start off with some questions. Um, and first off, I'll ask one um, that you kind of touched upon. Is integration of immigrants important? We know that it is happening and it will naturally occur on both sides, but um, is it important? Why? 
Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Let me let me just go back and say I do actually think there are there are huge differences still between Republicans and Democrats and their views of immigration. They have actually split over time. Uh, I guess the point that I would, wanted to drive home is that, especially if among Republicans and people who lean Republicans, they might not be as negative as you would think. Uh, so you know, for the most part, if you had a room full of a hundred Republicans like 45 to 50 percent of them, 45 to 50 of them, I should say, which is the same, actually, if in a room full of 100 Republicans as 45 or 50 percent, uh, would have largely positive views about immigrants. So I actually think that's kind of headline news today. But there's still massive differences between the two parties. One other thing that I'll mention, and you didn't really get a sense of it from the graphs, is that immigration used to be a really kind of bipartisan, nonpartisan issue. If you looked at attitudes about immigration, even 15 years ago, 20 years ago, especially, Democrats and Republicans were almost indistinguishable in, in their views. They have really kind of splintered in, in recent years, in about the last decade. Um, okay, so is integration important? I think it's incredibly important. I think it's incredibly important because um, I think that we need to have, uh, A, um, in order for a, a, for a democracy to thrive, you have to have, um, a, a population whose ability to participate in uh, economic and social and political life to, to be equal. And I think that, for me, is the goal of integration. The social aspect of it is quite complicated. And this is the, the play. I'm sorry, I'm getting tons of text messages all of a sudden. I don't know why. And I never know how to mute that. Um, so just ignore it <laughs> if you can. Um, uh, and I, the social aspect is really the messy part of it. And it's the one that people worry most about. And, um, and, I, and I think it's, it's important because we need to be able to tell a national story about who we are. We need to be able to find something in common with each other if we are going to kind of have a functioning democracy. And a, a prerequisite for that, I think, is, is a kind of equality of opportunity. I don't say equality of outcome, but equality of opportunity, which we know we don't have. We know we, we I mean, if you look at uh, educational institutions, if you look at the, the criminal justice system, if you look at the, the way neighborhoods are arrayed, and we may talk about that in a second, we know we don't have that equality of opportunity, but that's a, that's a prerequisite. Having said that, there are signs that I think are really significant that the social aspect of integration is happening. And I'll, and I'll highlight two things in particular. Uh, one is English language acquisition, um, that um, it is, it is uh, one of the things that we know improves the lives of immigrants is English language acquisition. Uh, and if you poll Americans, uh, U.S. born individuals or people who have naturalized, and if you poll immigrants, people who have not yet naturalized, one thing they all agree on is the importance of English language acquisition. Um, no one, I think, uh, believes, I shouldn't say no one, but uh, the, the overwhelming majority of people do not believe that English should replace other people's languages, that, you know, that there is a value to retaining. <clears throat> uh the the language that people bring with them but english language acquisition is huge it's really important for parents to communicate with their teachers for people to be able to get better jobs uh for the kind of basic functions of, of american society to happen um and then the other sign and it is and by the way it is happening so by their close to 60 percent of immigrants are, are proficient in english and close to 100% of their children by adulthood are completely fluent in English. So it's happening, and it's actually happening faster than it did uh, a century ago when the immigrants came overwhelmingly from Southern and Eastern Europe. So immigrants and their children are speaking English, or picking up English faster. The other sign, I think, is it has to do with intermarriage. Uh, and intermarriage, uh, you know, it should be said that the rate of people, adults getting married uh, has actually gone down. But intermarriage, cohabitation are still really important indicators of the degree to which people are having meaningful interactions with each other for very obvious reasons, right? I mean, marriage is a, it's, it's a, a legal commitment. It's also a kind of emotional commitment for, for most people. Um, and um, the two biggest sources of immigration are Latin America and Asia. And if you look at rates of intermarriage for people who have roots in Latin America and Asia, especially among the U.S. born, they're kind of off the charts. 
huge intermarriage rates. And what happens when uh, when people are intermarrying or cohabitating uh, is that they have children who have mixed backgrounds, which further contributes to to kind of integration. But then there's also a, a, an aspect of this that I that I mentioned a second ago, which is about a need to tell a national story. And there have always been competing versions of what it means to be American. And one of the versions, which is a relatively new version, is what my collaborator and um, Deborah Shield call, Kraut calls incorporationism. And it's the idea that who we are as a country is built on the notion that we're a nation of immigrants and that there are a significant share of the American population that believe that that is a core aspect of who we are, that, um, that we are, are nothing without immigrants, that we are, in fact, a nation of immigrants. There are competing versions of American identity. I think there's, a, there's an ethno-nationalist version of American identity that's rearing its head, and these are, these are kind of battling out right now. Uh, I personally think that the kind of nation of immigrants story will win out. I think there are problems with the nation of immigrants story, particularly as it relates to our African-American population. Um, so the, the idea of the nation of immigrants really gained popularity in the 1970s when it was pretty clear that the third generation descendants of the Southern and Eastern European immigrants had assimilated, had integrated, and they were kind of going back and embracing this immigrant heritage. It was the bicentennial in 1976 of the nation. And we, and we really uh, used some of our uh, to celebrate that bicentennial, some of our national symbols that related to immigration were, were the ones that they used. Um, and the the problem with it was that by so embracing it, we kind of left out a, a population who descended from slaves, and and um, not only made it um, I think more challenging to write them into the narrative of of the nation of immigrants, and some people did that in kind of in kind of clumsy ways. But also the nation of immigrants allowed some people to say that if their immigrant ancestors made it in the face of discrimination, in the face of poverty, uh, and, and in face of even legal forms of discrimination, then, um, then black people should be able to make it too. Not realizing that the, the very nature of the, of the um, origins of the African-American population in this country, the circumstances under which they lived for 200 years, 200 plus years, uh, created a very different set of circumstances for them. Having said that, I know I'm going on way too long, but I'm a professor. Um, <laughs> uh, having said that, one of the other, I think, things to keep in mind about today's immigrant population is that there is a large share of immigrants who, who are black. Uh, about 10% of the black population in the United States is foreign born. So there's a way in which even Black America, more than in the past, is, is in some ways being defined, um, although not, um, you know, it is being defined by the immigrant population. I think that's something that deserves attention. Great. I think um, Professor Chris Coden has a question. So, uh, Kylie, could you unmute him? Uh, thanks so much. I'm having a camera problems, so I apologize for that, but I okay. want to thank you at the outset for a, a superb talk and and I tell myself I follow this question closely, <laughs> but uh, I learned so much from your talk and, and took a lot of notes uh, while you were talking. Uh, my question really re revolves around the, the politics of moving the policy debate forward here, uh, especially on DACA, uh, the numbers you put forward are, ex and this ought to roll through <laughs> two houses on voice votes, uh, uh, and the data you present on uh, integration, um, again, very compelling. and and. So my question is, you know, what is the nature of the political disconnect from the very detailed uh, polling research that has been done and that you present here and, and, uh, and the state of our national debate? Uh, thank you, Chris. That's a great question. Um, so I think the first thing to say is that uh, the immigration is not unique in the disconnect between, especially on something like DACA, is not unique in the disconnect between our policy and um, and public opinion. I mean, a lot of people cite some aspects of gun control, where you have you know 
something like universal background checks just has overwhelming support, but we can't get that done <laughs> either. Um, so, uh, but when it comes to DACA, you know, there, there was an opportunity several years ago to push through, um, not DACA, but the DREAM Act, which is a, is a kind of more formal version of DACA, but that would also include the possibility of legal residency and ultimately citizenship. And um, my, I haven't read up on this recently, so forgive me, I'm going off on of my recollection, was that there, there was actually a group of Democrats who felt like they wanted to get a, a comprehensive package passed and so we're not inclined to push through just this little sliver. They wanted to be more aggressive and thought that if they, they took the sliver, they wouldn't get the whole log. Um, somebody can feel free to correct me if I'm wrong on that. And I, I think there's also potentially um, something wrong with the way we sell something like DACA. Um, I think that, you know, the, or, or the DREAM Act, um, we, we talk about the, the, um, potential recipients as being deserving, and I, and I think they are. I don't think that's a that's an, an untruth. Um, but the way that I would frame it uh, to get kind of broad support is for people to think about it not so much as a legalization program, which is prone to have. And I'm thinking I'm putting on my hat as a political scientist. I'm not a political scientist, so that hat is really really tiny. I don't even know what it would look like. It would look like a you know a doll hat or something like that. Um, but uh, in terms of like political framing, I would frame it not as as something that they deserve, but rather something that um, that is 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 not a legalization program, but a mass assimilation program. And nothing will assimilate immigrants faster than if we do this. Uh, and so, I actually think that would get people in the center and people on the right more on board, so that then politicians could, especially Republicans, could go back to their districts and feel less like they were going to be kind of yelled at or primaried. But, you know, um, that, that's, it is the kind of the, the people who are, not the people in the center, but the, the kind of people on the, uh, on the right, at least in terms of the op opposition, who are the loudest on this issue. So, you know, while I think a lot of this polling shows that overall the American public is, is supportive, uh, I think it's a separate question to ask, um, you know, what the intensity of that support is. Immigration is kind of to be it's sort of a low salience issue um, that that people care about it when when politicians talk about it, uh, but if you don't talk about it, they don't really think about it. Great, uh, thank you. I wanted to mention also I didn't get a chance to mention earlier, um, Dr. Chris. I mean, uh, Professor Chris Kojum is um, also the head of our Leadership and Ethics Initiative, who is co-hosting this event. Uh, oh, great! Yeah, thank you for thanks for co-hosting. Um, yeah. And uh, I wanted to follow up with another question actually on ethnic enclaves. Um, I, uh, this question says, how should we deal with the persistence of ethnic enclaves of immigrant communities and the oftentimes tensions that exist between enclaves and dominant communities? So in particular, do you think that this is something that we should actually try to address through policy sort of a yeah, well, so um, it's a great question, uh, and it's one that I think is on the minds of a lots of Americans. They complain about immigrants kind of clustering together. Um, I actually think if we did away with immigrant enclaves, and you know, the the social scientific definition of an enclave usually means a, an area, a, a geographic area where um, where a particular ethnic group resides, but also does business. Um, so the enclave has a kind of uh, a, a kind of um, economic aspect to it, but let's just say ethnically concentrated neighborhoods. Is that more what you mean, Professor Lal? Do you just do you mean ethnically concentrated neighborhoods, or or is the economic aspect of requirement for this definition? Um, whichever way you want to take okay. it. Both. <laughs> yeah. So I actually, I so um, you know, I, 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 I many of us have immigrant backgrounds and know that when our families came to the U.S., we sought out communities that um, were familiar, and we seek out those communities that are familiar not just because um, there's a sense of cultural comfort, but also because those communities often provide really valuable resources to help newcomers get a foothold, economic resources, uh, information about. Uh, about schools, information about how to find jobs, information about how to find housing. So I think if you know there were policies to kind of do away with um, with ethnically concentrated neighborhoods or to spread people out, I'll say something about that in a second. 
it might actually hurt some of the people who come here who kind of need um, that foundation to then launch. Uh, in, 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 uh, that launch can take uh, a generation or two, but nonetheless, to launch into American society. Um, you know, I guess the closest thing we have to something like that would be a refugee resettlement program. And the refugee resettlement program actually does try to um, spread out refugees who come here. By the way, there are no refugees coming here <laughs> right now, um, but spread out refugees and asylees with the intention that they'll kind of integrate. And then what has happened, and I'm thinking in particular of the Southeast Asian refugee population that came largely in the late 70s and uh, and throughout the 80s, is that they settled in places initially like the Gulf Coast, uh, like um, like uh, the Minneapolis, St. Paul metro region, San Jose, Fresno, San Diego, uh, and 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 then a lot of them in the Midwest, play little towns like Garden City, Kansas, which is that Finney County, Kansas. I mentioned there was a huge Vietnamese immigrant population. Then they made secondary migrations where they wanted to go to places where there were lots of other Vietnamese. And so they tended to concentrate actually in those areas that I just mentioned, um, even after being settled throughout. So, um, so I don't think we need to do away with them. I actually think that the dominant trend and still continues to be the dominant trend is kind of neighborhood integration over time. The second generation often moves out. This is, this is not to deny that there, is, um, that there is a lot of segregation in the United States, uh, segregation, especially for Blacks and Latinos, and, and less so though, but still significantly for Latinos, even in the second and third generation, but it tends to decline over time. So, um, you know, integration is, it takes time. And we as a, as a, as a kind of population can, can grow really impatient. And the other thing I want to mention about integration that, that maybe I didn't emphasize enough is that I think that it's something that we're all doing. And it goes back to the last point that I made, and this this is more of a kind of I don't know mindset rather that comes from my sort of you know my my kind of philosophical side rather than my social scientific side. Um, it goes back to the last point I made about the the kind of Marvel universe that there are pure people and impure, there are bad guys and good guys, and and I think that um, especially in doing research for my last book uh, where I studied people who are not immigrants or the children of immigrants, I studied people who were. Um, living in areas that had um, seen a huge influx of immigrants and asking how the long established populations were adjusting. And you hear how complicated their views are. They're a mix of kind of, um, of kind of positive and negative, a mix of frustration and joy. Um, and, um, and in the process, I think you see a kind of flip side of what you see among immigrants, a sense of gain and loss a sense of frustration and joy, a sense of opportunities gained and opportunities lost. And so there's some symmetry here in the way that, that we adjust to each other, but the adjustment nonetheless happens. And I, and I think that going back to the question of kind of American identity, which, which you may not have asked, but I raised myself, um, I think what we've seen historically, and I think what we're seeing again is a, a, a kind of, a, and I'm borrowing here from, from my friend Richard Alba's notion of a kind of evolving mainstream. Um, that you know the American the American society has never been a monolith. It is, an, and a notion of the mainstream has always evolved, and it evolves in large measure because immigrants contribute over generations something to it. They contribute something to what we regard as normal, but that a hundred years ago would have never been thought as normal. In fact, it was thought of as threatening. I mean, you know, Americans have a very strong uh, religious identity, and 100 years ago, that religious identity was Protestant. And today we talk about a Judeo-Christian American society. That Judeo part would have never been in there 100 years ago, and the Christian part would have excluded Catholics. Um, and so, um, and, and notions of a kind of what it meant to be ethnically mainstream has evolved as well. And I actually think we're seeing that. You have to keep in mind that we are still relatively close to peak uh, Asian and Latin American immigration in terms of a time horizon. So if we make kind of big prognostications about integration today, uh, it would be, I think, tantamount to standing in like 1930 and making big prognostications about what was going to happen because of the big wave of immigrants that had been coming here. And, and so keep that in mind. Um, yeah. Um, I follow up with another question, uh, completely different. 
uh, about recent events. So two major things this year, we've got Black Lives Matter. How does that impact? Um, uh, how do you think that impacts uh, American views of immigration? And secondly, the pandemic. I mean, these things mm -hmm. kind of stuck together, but the pandemic has shut off borders. And, yeah. uh, you know, what, what does that mean for both uh, conceptually what we feel about immigration and practically what does it mean for what's happening to immigration? I'm going to go backwards. I'll answer the first question first. And, and you might want to get out a pen and paper and write this down because my prediction is going to, is absolutely going to come true. No, I'm kidding. I, I, I mean, the truth is, I don't know. I would speculate, though, um, that, you know, Immigration is not just driven by laws. We have this notion that if we change laws, that immigration patterns change. And that's true. They're affected by laws. But immigration is a social process, too. It's driven by networks um, uh, that, that um, you know, lead to the kind of ethnically concentrated neighborhoods we talked about. People tend to go from one neighborhood to a particular place, let's say, in Mexico or, or the Philippines. Um, and so those networks are in some ways being severed right now. Um, they're severed by the pandemic. They're severed by the policy reaction of the pandemic. And so I don't, I don't know. I do actually think it's possible that we might see a massive decline in immigration. We're going to go through a period of tremendous economic, we're already in a period of tremendous economic hardship. I don't think that we're going to have a, we're going to have a vaccine and it's just going to turn around suddenly. Um, People are really suffering right now, and a lot of the people who are suffering are the immigrant communities, but it, and the economy as a whole is suffering. And so the demand for labor that um, is probably going to be slow to ramp up, uh, and um, the kinds of networks that drove immigration for a long time are, are being cut off. And this is not to mention the legal pathways. Uh, and, you know, if, if we continue to have a Trump administration, uh, if President Trump wins re-election, you know, we're going to see a continuation of those policies, and, and that will happen only further, that kind of severing. The, so we could be entering a period, as we have been for the last decade with Mexican immigration, where we have a big hiatus of immigration. And I think that changes the character of the United States. I think it changes what integration means. Uh, I think it changes a lot of things. I think it changes the predictions about the coming of a majority-minority society. Um, so I think that changes a lot of things. And in terms of Black Lives Matter, boy, that, it's it's hard to draw a connection on the spot between what it means for American attitudes about immigration. The the people I think who felt threatened, especially um, you know not just working class whites, but who already felt threatened by changing demography uh, and and had a kind of adverse reaction to. Uh, Black Lives Matter, I think that there is a way in which they sweep all of that into the same bucket and say that, um, that you know, the, the protests are, are part of this kind of threat. Um, this is not me speaking against the threat. This is me trying to think as a social scientist about how people are reacting to it. Um, I think on the other hand, there's a real opportunity here um, to build um, coalitions that um, really see the kinds of threats to um, that have been around for hundreds of years, literally, uh, the kinds of threats to the kind of fullest notion of citizenship for African Americans as part and parcel of the kind of threats that are visited uh, upon immigrant communities and their inability to integrate. And I really do take heart. I mean, the, the, the kind of the key notion of Black Lives Matter is the Black Lives Matter that, you know, we have to kind of lift up the fact that African Americans have suffered uh, disproportionately, that there is, uh, there, that is, is a unique experience, that there is some danger in terms of our focus in, in, uh, in policy and achieving some kind of justice. There is some danger in kind of lumping, lumping everyone into into the same bucket. But I actually think the sweet spot is to recognize the the unique attention and focus that needs to be paid to the black experience, and and calls for justice while also um, sweeping up a larger swath of the population that experiences some of the. Um, that also experiences discrimination and injustice, even if it's a different source and even if it's uh, even if the intensity and ferocity and the history is different. I, I think that we're much better off if there is a if there is a kind of broad coalition. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, to continue to recognize that Black Lives Matter and while, while also kind of um, pushing for calls for justice for, for multiple kinds of communities. Okay. Almost related to that, just a, a quick one on, um, you know, recently we're seeing an increasing trend for people to push Americans to choose one identity or the other even though increasingly we appear to be a mixed race nation. Yeah. But for example, you know, Cardi B was in the news recently that, you know, some people were saying, well, she's not black enough because she's too Latina. Some people say, no, no, she's Latina. She's black. You know, there's, uh, you know, choose an identity. What, what do you think is pushing this, this kind of pull, push and pull on, on immigration identity versus black identity or what? They yeah, do? no, that's, a, I, I actually think this, this is, um, these are, these are, I think, kind of conversations that are happening in social media and on college campuses <laughs> to a large, and, and those are important places. College campuses uh, in particular are incredibly important institutions. Um, and it's interesting because about 20 years ago, there was this kind of mass embrace of our kind of multiracial roots and multiracial roots as a kind of collective, but also among individuals that like there was this explosion of kids who were born to um, parents of different backgrounds. And even if you look at like compare 19, excuse me, 2000 census, which is the first time people were able to check multiple boxes, which was as a result of uh, activism in the 1990s among mixed race families. Uh, and then if you look at, so you compare 2000 census to 2010, there's like this explosion of people who are like checking multiple boxes. It's pretty good people who check black and something else. And that was in some ways seen, I think, as a kind of victory uh, for for kind of, you know, a diverse society that like we were recognizing that we were all actually kind of mixed. You know, people who were like Henry Louis Gates were promoting things like 23andMe, we can discover how mixed we are. We're also celebrating this. Um, but I actually think that the protests and, and in the last few years, there has been a kind of notion that we exist in, um, in hermetically sealed uh, identity groups. And I, it's very curious to me. And, and I think that this kind of happens in protests in general, uh, that when protests flare up of any kind, whatever, whatever it is, there is a kind of call to figure out what side you're on. And part of that call right now, I think, takes the form of people kind of claiming a pure identity. Like we've all become purists, right? You're good or bad, you're pure and impure, you're this or you're that. Um, and it's really like a, almost like a backlash to the, to the kind of postmodern movement of the 90s, which was intellectual, but I also think kind of filtered into American society in general, which is like, I'm not this or that, I'm this and that. Um, but I, I mean, I've seen it on my own campus where there is a, you know, um, where I've seen um, students in particular kind of working out some of these issues and, and also even kind of talking about faculty as a uh, as being kind of one or the other, or kind of what side are you really on based on how you look versus your surname? I could be talking about myself. I may or may not. I don't know if you can tell, but I look really white. Um, <laughs> uh, and so it, it is curious. I think part of it is a movement. I think if you go back to, um, you know, uh, the women's liberation movement, I think if you go back to the civil rights movement, the ethnic pride movements of the 1960s and 70s, if you go to the, the kind of gay rights movement, there's always a notion of these movements flare up to kind of figure out who's in and who's out. And I think some of that is filtering into things like, you know, Cardi B having to choose. Whereas, you know, 20 years ago when Cardi B, I don't know, was like five years old, I don't know how much old she is, people would have been like, isn't this, you know, people would have kind of celebrated the, the her multiraciality, her multi-ethnicity. So it's a it's a curious moment. It's a curious moment because for people like me who grew up in the in the period of the 80s and 90s when there was this kind of movement to embrace all of who you are, to kind of run into people who are much younger than me, who I assume will kind of further embrace that. And in fact, who themselves as a generation are way more mixed than, than my generation was, kind of um, kind of go back to this notion that, that we, uh, we exist in, in these kind of sealed groups uh, and, and that there are bright lines separating them um, is curious and, and I actually think Again, this is kind of what exists on college campuses. If you go out into the world, I think it's more complicated than that, but college campuses are important. Yeah. All right. I, I think I can squeeze in one last little one before we run out of time, if you don't mind. All right. No. The last one is, um, so, you know, there's obviously a big divide in this country, controversy over undocumented immigrants. Some people say we should not have 
any immigration controls. On the other hand, yeah. of course, we have this political push from the right saying we shouldn't have any immigration at all yeah. and to preserve jobs or identity or whatever. Um, so what do you think is a reasonable approach to immigration today? And for example, the question is, why would people apply for a visa if you can get in without one? Um, that's a great question. So the first thing I want to say is I actually think most people don't think we should either have open borders or have closed borders. Uh, and I'm drawing on my research in Arizona, New Mexico, where um, even when we interviewed the most um, kind of staunch Republicans, uh, they believed, for example, that um, that you had to have really strong border security. Uh, but they also believe that a solution to having no undocumented immigration, or rather no undocumented immigrants, was to legalize the people who are here, and that would kind of take care of it. I interview, We interviewed people who uh, politically are on the left. In fact, some people are undocumented immigrants themselves who said, no, you need to have some border security because there are bad people coming across. And um, but, but, we're probably, we're, but we're also... I think more strongly in favor of a legalization program, not just for personal interest, but because of, of uh, a, a kind of collective interest. So I actually think going back to something I said a bit ago about people having complicated views, I actually think that portrayal uncomplicates views that are actually quite complicated. Um, what's a reasonable immigration policy? It is, it is um, I think it's a policy that, um, that uh, spends less money on border security. Um, part of it is that the, the border is actually relatively quiet. And part of my view comes from um, not just that I don't believe necessarily that we should have just unfettered immigration. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, when we have ramped up the, the border and there's tons of research showing this, it has actually had the opposite effect. We have uh, we've made crossing the border uh, clandestinely more expensive, more dangerous, and more deadly, and uh, and actually kept people from going back and forth instead of coming and staying. So um, I, you know, I still kind of believe in comprehensive immigration reform, even though it seems somewhat dated now and um, and maybe quaint given our times. But um, that I and I think the the pinnacle and not the pinnacle, the centerpiece of that needs to be a, a legalization program. Uh, I think there needs to be opportunities for people to come here um, and to work and not just come here to work, but also opportunities to stay once they're here. Um, I, I, you know, I don't think it's reasonable to expect um, anyone to get on board with, uh, with a kind of open immigration system. I mean, you do have some people who say the borders are kind of unethical. Uh, and there's an argument to be made for that, but you know this this goes back to some old kind of political philosophy about the the importance of a political community to be able to determine its memberships. And so, and I kind of believe in that. Um, but I do think that we can have an immigration policy that that is consistent with what we profess to be as um, not just a nation of immigrants, but also a nation where people can come and find a sense of economic freedom, religious freedom. Um, you know, I, I, one of the most, and I'm being very anecdotal here, it's not very social scientific, but um, the last class I ever taught at UC San Diego when I was there, we had a discussion about what it means to be American, and the most articulate versions of what it mean, meant to be American came from the immigrants in the room. And there was one woman in particular who was a refugee uh, from Sudan. And she said that when I come here, when I when I'm in Sudan and I wear a headscarf, I'm treated as a particular way. That's that defines me. And when I come here, and this is not that long after 9/11, she's saying this. When I come here, I get treated like an individual. Uh, and you know, for her, there's a kind of dual comparison that many of us don't have. But I actually think that what she was articulating is partly from her own experience, but it's also aspirational. So I mean, we have to have something that's consistent with who we are. And what I'm part of the point I was trying to make in my talk is that who we are is actually a more generous to immigrants than we think we are. And so if we can have an immigration policy that's more consistent with the vision that I think the American people have, that that's a better policy. I realize I'm punting on all of the specifics, but it's really complicated. It's not as complicated as canceling one unit of the immigration enforcement arm and adding another. And it's really complicated. And so you know, we do well to push, but also recognize that that there are those complications. 
Oh, well, thank you so much. I know we just uh, went past 130. Um, that was really exciting and very, very informative. Um, so I really, really appreciate you joining us and sharing your insights with us. Um, and Kylie, I wanted to. Yeah, I was just going to echo thank you both so much for your time and for being here and to everyone who joined us today. Um, and I will share the recording link afterwards. I know there's a lot of folks who are very interested in the program, but couldn't attend at this time. So thank you again. And Dr. Jimenez, be safe out in California. <laughs> I will. You as, well. you as well. And I hope we get to meet you in person someday. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Take care now. Bye-bye. Okay. Kylie, I'm going to